Welcome to the RV Podcast. This is episode 440. And in this episode, how to dewinterize your RV advice from a pro. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Wendlin, and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer, and this is another episode of the RV Podcast. And uh, today we're going to start, really will be a couple of episodes back-to-back to to help you get ready for spring. I mean, come on, this is the most exciting time in the (laughs) RV world, isn't it not? Yeah, who, when you get get rid of that antifreeze and get your rigs fresh water flowing again. And we're delighted to have as our guest uh, one of the most respected RV pros in the industry, Chris Doherty. He'll be with us in just a couple of minutes. And uh, Chris really knows his stuff. He is going to uh, uh, help us understand all the things we need to do to get ready for uh, spring, how to dewinterize our RV. And we're also going to be starting a new segment in the podcast from uh, Brenda, the queen bee of RV. Uh, Brenda is an RV inspector. We had her as a guest, of, I don't know, three weeks ago, maybe. And the mm-hmm. uh, response to her segment was terrific. And we're going to have Brenda with us uh, every week offering RV tips. And this week, her RV tips are going to have to do with setting up a checklist to get ready to go out uh, for the next season of camping. So we're excited about that. Uh, but to start off, we had a lot of feedback from last week's article or la- and our, uh, our interview um, about the dangers of developing blood clots from sitting too long in an RV. That really struck a chord with a oh, lot yeah. of us. Uh, I'm one of those who needs to be reminded about the need to get out and exercise while you, you know, stop driving for a while and move around. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do because, I mean, I'm competitive enough when you're driving in all those cars and trucks, you pass. You don't want to pull off and then have to pass them again. (laughs) I understand this. You really are competitive that way. I am that way. I, I like to keep going too, but we shouldn't. And in uh, last week's episode, we talked to a woman uh, whose husband died of a blood clot. He literally dropped dead after they had come into a campsite after uh, a day of driving. Uh, and in the interview, she shared how her membership in the FMCA, uh, the organization the FMCA for our viewers, greatly helped her during the time of need. So we've got some feedback we want to share with you. All right. Our first feedback is from Angela. And Angela says, This is something I think about often, and we have traveled long distances without stopping as well. No more. We will definitely be stopping more often after hearing about this tragedy. We joined FMCA a year ago, and I let our membership lapse in January. After realizing this last month, I immediately called and paid that $50 to get our membership up to date. After hearing your story, I am so glad I did. That $50 is nothing compared to what they do in these situations and such a peace of mind. God bless you, Angela. Well, it, it not only did you do that, Angela, but so did I. I went and checked on my membership and uh, our joint membership uh, expires uh, sometime in April. And uh, I said, well, I'm just going to renew it right now. Uh, it's really the best investment we can make. We just think the world of the FMCA. And uh, uh, it was a great interview that we had. But the most important part of that was don't stay behind the wheel too long. Get out there and move around. Take frequent exercise breaks. And uh, we also heard from a lot of doctors and, and nurses who um, said they had treated people with these blood clots from driving too long. They underscored the advice that we presented in the podcast about taking those exercise breaks when uh, doing RV travel. Uh, And uh, there's another topic that we we had a lot of feedback on. About, uh, we had a lot of feedback about uh, the RV lifestyle blog story about the sudden shutdown of our village. Now, that has been acquired by a company owned by Thor Industries, the the largest RV uh, corporation in the world. Yeah. And 
Want me to read the little? Yeah, yeah. I think that this is. We had so much feedback about this from members who were disappointed and and uh, really uh, many felt they were blindsided by this shutdown. And here's kind of the one from Monica who really sort of I think uh, uh, summarized what a lot of people were telling us. Summed it up for everybody. I was a gold member of our village and sad to see it go. I enjoyed going to two of their rallies. I learned a lot about RV stuff there and got to meet several YouTube RVers we uh, follow at the uh, last one we went to. I will also miss knowing when a fellow RV villager comes to our area. I have uh, met some nice people through their app and these uh, notifications. I will be sad to see this end. Big corporations always mess things up. And that was Monica. That was Monica. Many others kind of echoed that same thought. Um, so thanks to everybody for the feedback. We really do read all your feedback, and we appreciate it. We share it here. Uh, if you get something that you hear in this podcast, or if you have a question that you'd like Jennifer and I to uh, address in a future episode of the RV Podcast, our, our private email is mikeandjen at rvlifestyle.com. When we come back, uh, the interview of the week, and it's time to start thinking about your RV and getting it back on the road after it's a long winter sleep. We'll be right back. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds, competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that just might be right for you. It was for us. Jennifer and I bought some land just west of Nashville, Tennessee, in an incredible collection of mountaintop properties called the Woodlands at Buffalo River. These are 5 to 140 acre properties. Build a house, a cabin, outbuildings, or RV year-round, starting at $79,900. It's your property, your way, 100% ownership, and the scenery is breathtaking. You can landscape, garden, bring your pets, build what you want to. There's high-speed internet, and it's so private. It's a great place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations. It's ready whenever you want. They're selling these by appointments, 5 to 140 acre sites from $79,900. There's great financing and big discounts on multi-lot packages. For information, visit MyRVLand.com. That's MyRVLand.com. All right, welcome back. Time now for our RV interview of the week. Now, as the weather starts to warm up and, and you want to get your RV ready so you can take off and have a good time, you don't want any glitches at the last minute. You want to get that puppy ready and be off. <laughs> yeah. So if your RV has been in storage for the winter, um, there are a number of very important steps that you'll need to take to get it ready for spring. Now, we got you covered. Uh, with RV uh, dewinterizing tips, and they're going to come from a pro. A friend of ours named Chris Doherty. We've had Chris on the program before. Chris is well known across the country. He does seminars and he presents uh, maintenance tips at all of the large RV shows around the country. He's a consultant to the industry, and from checking the battery to flushing the water system, uh, RV tech expert Chris Doherty's advice is going to ensure that your RV is in top condition and ready for all of your adventures. So uh, we want you to meet Chris. He's been in the industry for more than 20 years. Uh, he trains new and experienced RV techs as well as RVers like uh, you and me at uh, some of the big shows. So without any uh, further ado, as they say, Chris Doherty. Well, as always, we are delighted to have uh, Chris Doherty on the uh, podcast. Chris, how are you? Happy spring. Happy spring, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Doing very well. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's great. Well, it's it's always good to uh, to have you on and to tap into your expertise. And at this time of year, if I'm right, uh, a lot of our it's, followers are like digging out those manuals and trying to remember what they did in the fall to winterize and how to reverse it and get it up. So <laughs> let's kind of go through that, how to get it, that whole system back up and working uh, with uh, the summer season coming up. So let me start. Is is winterizing something that the average, or dewinterizing, is that something that the average person can do? 
maybe they had it, you know, uh, winterized uh, at a dealership in the fall and they're wondering, can they do this themselves? Absolutely. So this is uh, considered an owner maintenance uh, item. Uh, some people prefer to have their dealership do it and check the unit over before, you know, they take it out for the spring and that's just fine. Uh, but if it's something you want to do, absolutely, you can do it. Uh, when you're talking about dewinterizing an RV, most people think uh, right away of the plumbing system, right? And so uh, a couple little tips with regard to that. Uh, so most uh, times we want to kind of do a, a mix of um, dewinter, you know, dewinterizing the plumbing system as well as uh, sanitizing uh, the water system for the season. So we can kind of mix these into one uh, uh, little um, package that makes it a lot easier to do and you can get kind of two things done at once. So what we recommend is uh, go ahead and fill your fresh water tank uh, with water and a hypochlorite solution. Okay, there's instructions of, on this in your owner's manual and online, you can find it. Uh, the Public Health Service uh, recommends using anywhere from a quarter to a half a cup of plain chlorine bleach. So plain Clorox, no spring fresh, no mountain laurels, whatever thing, okay? And uh, put uh, that in and then fill it with water. Uh, and then you're gonna turn your water pump on, run that through the system, but we're not going to bypass, unbypass the water heater yet. Okay, we still wanna leave the water heater bypassed. Get that flush through the whole system. Make sure that you hit your low point drains, your washer dryer hookup if you have one, so on and so forth. Once you've done all that, then unbypass your water heater. And that's when you can get that uh, uh, solution through that. And once we have uh, that flowing through all the faucets and everything else, uh, we'll let that sit and just leave it sit three to four hours or overnight is fine. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is drain the whole system and then uh, refill it with fresh water and flush the system through and you'll be in good shape. Now, uh that quarter cup of uh, of uh, Clorox that you're putting in to mm -hmm. sanitize it, you do recommend then leaving it in there for a little bit after you run it through. You get the pink stuff out of the out of the you know that you the antifreeze that you've had in it. The pink stuff mm -hmm. is out. You smell that chloride uh, stuff coming through because it does mm -hmm. smell. But just uh, leave it overnight's a good thing to do. Then right, kind of gets sure. Sick. Yep, absolutely. And the way the the process reads is, uh, you know, you use a quarter cup of uh, household bleach uh, per 15 gallons of tank capacity. So I would use a half a cup for a 30 gallon water tank, right? Yep. If you have a problem, uh, you know, an odor problem, something like that, uh, you know that you've had some compromise of the water system that way. So you pulled up mud or you did something else, something was growing in it. You can increase that to half a cup uh, per 30 or per 15 gallons. And in uh, the other thing that they tell you too, is you can kind of speed the process up. So if you're um, if in normal circumstances, so you have just kind of a normal system you're starting up, you can do the half a cup and then just leave it for an hour and then flush it out. And that works pretty good. Okay. Now, I know a lot of people actually do it the first time they get into, you know, they may be heading south on their first trip and they'll do it at the RV resort because they've got city water there. You recommend that flushing it with the water in the fresh water tank rather than hooking up to city water? And then I do. And, and, and again, what that's doing for us is we're sanitizing the system at the same time. So this allows us to sanitize the fresh water tank. Uh, as well as the rest of the plumbing system. When they go to flush the system after they've done their sanitizing, they don't have to re refill the fresh water tank. They could leave it if they're not gonna use it and hook up the city water at that point just to flush it out. And it gets most of the residual chlorine out of the system and uh, whatever's left is absolutely harmless. And and how long does it take just one, usually one flush to get rid of that chloride? Yeah, absolutely. That usually works pretty nicely. Just flush it, you know, and, and it's usually a little bit easier with that uh, hooked up to city water. And there'll be a little bit of chlorine residual in the fresh water tank, but that's kind of where we want it uh, because that's left open to air inside the, the tank. And uh, especially if we don't use it that much, that'll make sure we don't have anything start to grow inside the tank. 
Yeah, well, once we've done that, we've sanitized the, the pipes pretty good and people say, well, that isn't so hard. Do you recommend they do that during the season as well or is once a year okay for that? Once a year is usually fine. The only uh, time you're going to want to repeat that is if you, uh, a couple of times. One is if you get into a, or you bring water into the system that is compromised. So we do travel with our RVs. And as a result, uh, you can go to a campground that may have questionable water. And I always recommend everybody pre-filter any water going into the RV. So whether you're filling your fresh water tank or you are, um, uh, you know, just uh, working off of city water, make sure you have a good filter on there. At least the, like the blue cartridge ones you can put in the garden hose or something better. Uh, uh, never yeah, put raw water in. Solid block. Uh, and I've really noticed a difference when I use that. It's actually I'm using a two-stage filter. And that mm -hmm. really does seem to help. Uh, but speaking of filters, what about the, uh, many of the RVs have a filter uh, inside the coach or inside mm -hmm. the camper. What uh, what do you recommend about that? Do they replace them or can they put those back on? Any any tips on getting that dewinterized and hooked back up? So you should definitely replace the filter media at the beginning of the season uh, or replace it once a year or six months, depending on the manufacturer. If you're a full-timer uh, and you're spending a lot of time, then I would be looking at my water flow, make sure that I have decent water flow. If it starts to slow up, that may mean that the um, that the filter is getting plugged up. And the other thing is, um, uh, you know, most of the manufacturers are going to recommend a maximum amount, amount of time uh, that it's in service. So if it's six months or a year or whatever it is, you'll change it at that interval. Those of us who are storing over the winter time, you know, spring is a perfect time to, to change that out. Uh, you know, the other thing too, is we have a couple of different types of filter systems, right? So you have a built-in one that's just off the city water. Uh, and then you may have uh, a sink uh, uh, filter for drinking water, for instance. So it might be under the, the galley sink or whatnot. And so don't forget those filters as well. Uh, so many times you hear people, they'll, they'll send emails or they'll look on one of the RV forums. And I think of our uh, RV lifestyle group on Facebook. You, you'll see people saying, help, I'm dewinterizing and water is pouring out underneath my RV. Mm -hmm. That's usually a valve that they haven't set right, isn't it? Yeah, hopefully that's all it is. Um, so I mentioned earlier about making sure you dewinterize your low point drains. And so when we talk about winterizing, we want to hit every part of the plumbing system. And the same thing goes uh, in the spring, we want to dewinterize those uh, because they'll hold antifreeze in them, right? And so if we don't flush those out, they can hold a little bit of antifreeze. And then every now and then you're going to get a little taste of antifreeze in your water, a little bit of that peppermint smell uh, and a little foaming. And, and that is disheartening for folks. So, um, you know, just like you would, uh, you know, clean a bottle or clean something in your sink very thoroughly, you're going to want to flush the, uh, the water system thoroughly, make sure you're getting all the, the pieces of the system done. Now, um, a lot of people have had their RVs winterized professionally by somebody, and then they're going to go out and try and dewinterize it themselves. And you say low point drain, and that's another question we get. What's my low point drain? And I guess we should point out that every RV has one of those, and it's how you would drain the freshwater tank. Mm -hmm. And they should know how you might have to crawl underneath it. That's the darn side about that. Well, it, first of all, you can have, you'll have at least three low point drains. So you're going to have one for the cold water plumbing, one for the hot water plumbing, and then you'll have a tank drain, uh, which is what you were just alluding to. So you can drain all of those together. Um, so your low point drains depends on what kind of RV you have. If you have one that is designed for four season use, it'll probably have valves for the low point drain somewhere inside the heated space of the RV. Okay. So you'll be able to pull the valve up or quarter turn open it so that it will drain. Uh, if it's not a four season unit, often what they'll do is either have a valve or a plumbing cap on the end of the pipe that is hanging down under the RV. And so you just reach down and, and undo that and uh, that will allow your, your plumbing to drain. And you can just, if you're looking to drain your system, you just go up and open your faucets and gravity will do the rest of the work for you. What other things on the interior of the RVs should we do as part of our dewinterizing process? Uh, 
So that's a great question, Mike. Um, so I know up here in the Northeast, we have an issue with mice getting into RVs, right? And so um, that's something, if you've had your RV stored over the winter time, hopefully you don't have the problem, but I like to take a look where all the mechanicals are, right? So look under sinks, look in cabinets, under beds, things like that, and make sure that I haven't had any damage from rodents or any nests or things like that. Uh, and when I put pressure to the water system, I'm also going to be looking to make sure I don't have any leaks. So if something wasn't winterized correctly or rodents got in and chewed on piping or whatever, I want to notice that leak as quickly as I can. You know, I've seen people take a unit out for the first time in the season, they hook up to fresh water and then go enjoy a, an adult beverage until they hear the water, you know, pouring out of the door. Um, you know, like a water feature. And uh, that's not uh, a, a good thing that anybody wants to, to have happen. So I'm looking for that. Um, I want to make sure, obviously, the unit's clean. And I usually recommend a certain amount of maintenance in the fall before you put the RV in storage. Uh, but we're certainly going to clean everything, make sure everything's good. We're going to test all of the systems. So I want to test uh, the uh, furnace, make sure that that's working. You know, when it gets warm enough, we're going to test our heat pump or air conditioner. Uh, we'll obviously fire off the water heater once we have it in uh, water in it, the refrigerator, uh, and check through, make sure everything's nice and clean and ready to go. And then, of course, we're going to start stocking our RV for the season. Um, and anything that we find that's broken, any burned out lights or, um, you know, other problems, we'll work on either fixing ourselves or getting fixed. Uh, fire extinguishers is something most people are never told to, to check. And uh, I bet you got some advice about that for us. So absolutely. So the safety equipment on the RV is very important to check, not just uh, extinguishers, but also your detectors and your emergency exits. So when we're talking about fire extinguishers, the first thing we're going to do is take a look and make sure our fire extinguisher is there and it has pressure in it. Uh, newer RVs are going to have a 10, uh, a, uh, A10BC fire extinguisher, uh, which is going to be mounted uh, relatively close to the main entry door. So we're going to take a look at that and it should have a little push button on the top that you depress and it should pop back up and it'll indicate that it has pressure and you're just going to check and make sure that the mounting is in good shape and you should be good there. I always recommend having a couple of fire extinguishers. So if you want to add any, uh, that's fine. But the one is, uh, you know, a, a standard requirement uh, for RVs. Your safety detectors are another thing. So you've got your smoke detector, you have a carbon monoxide detector and a propane detector in your RV. They may be combined, a couple of them together. Um, the propane and CO detectors are very often hardwired. Not all, uh, the CO detector is sometimes battery powered, but um, a lot of times you have a combination CO and propane detector. So you wanna test that, make sure it's working. Uh, they usually have a service life of about five years, and a lot of them will have a signal that will tell you if the unit needs to be replaced, but we want to make sure that that's operational. And then when we start to season out with our smoke detector, we want to make sure we're putting a new battery in it. Uh, so, um, you know, new 9-volt battery, start the season out with that, and we'll be in, in good shape with that. The last thing I wanted to mention was emergency exits. So every RV is required to have alternate emergency exits on, other than the main doors. So if you, uh, wherever your emergency exit is, in most cases, you'll be able to operate it uh, just fine yourself and you should exercise it. So you should go and open it however it needs to be open. Um, if it's sticky, uh, you're gonna wanna fix that. Uh, sometimes you can just lubricate the seals if they're sticking with a little bit of uh, uh, like a slide out seal conditioner or something along those lines. But if it's something physical that's hanging it up and you think it'll be hard to open in the event of emergency, then you'll want to have that looked at um, by a professional to either adjust the window or replace it and then uh, if it needs it. It's time to go out and do some camping. And get Absolutely. That baby out there on the road. Yep. And, Absolutely. And these are, of course, we should point out our, our sort of generalized instructions because every RV is different and mm -hmm. everybody has different valves and located in different places. So this is no substitute for them actually getting out the manual and looking <laughs> at it. Last question, people say, I can't find my manual. Uh, how do they find a manual for their RV? So uh, it's real easy. So actually a lot of RVs today don't come with physical manuals anymore. They come with a USB jump drive or something along those lines. Um, and the manuals are 
usually always located online. And even in legacy RVs, you do a search online. If I, um, you know, had an old Monaco or something that had, and the company's been out of business for a long time now, um, what, 14 years, whatever, 15 years, uh, those are still available. So you can go online and either the owners groups or the companies that have taken over for, you know, that manufacturer will have their manuals on there. The other thing you can look for too is the individual components. So you have a general owner's manual and then you'll have a Norcold refrigerator or a Dometic furnace or, um, you know, duo therm air conditioner or whatever. So uh, get the model and serial number of it in the make and uh, do a search online and you'll be able to find manuals for those as well. Chris, as, as always, uh, excellent advice. Uh, tell our audience how they can learn more about uh, taking care of their RVs and tapping into your expertise. How do they find you? <laughs> well, you can, uh, I do uh, consumer shows around the, um, around the country, mostly in the Northeast these days. Uh, so you'll see me at uh, some different events, including Hershey, the uh, Hershey uh, RV show, America's largest RV show coming up. And uh, you can reach out to me at DohertyRV.com. And uh, I'm always open to try to answer questions and things there. Uh, and you'll see me uh, in family RVing and some other um, places here and there. I will put links to them in the description below. And as always, Chris, thanks so much for making time for us and helping us uh, to uh, get to know our rigs a little bit and get them ready for another season. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. You're very welcome. Chris does such a good job telling us what we need to do, and he's done so many workshops and presentations all across the country, and he puts it in terms that you can understand, that you can apply, that you can use, and what a great brush up. Yep. we yep. got to get back into it again. Yeah, I uh, appreciate it, Chris. We'll have Chris on again uh, in, on a future episode. Uh, next week, we're going to continue this sort of getting ready for spring uh, topic with a look at how to wake up your RV's electrical system after its long winter nap. Uh, Mike Sokol will be our guest next week. And coming up in just a moment, a brand new segment, uh, the RV Tip of the Week. We'll hear uh, Brenda of Queen Bee RV. She's going to become a regular, and she's going to offer a spring checkup list for you uh, to get ready to go RVing. So stay with us. We'll be right back after this. The one thing that can ruin a perfect RV trip is a bad mattress. And believe us, we know. Over the years, we've tried many and found them all wanting. Until now. Now, we sleep on the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Quite simply, it's the best we've ever slept on. We chose a queen-size Aurora Lux medium firm mattress, and it arrived tightly rolled in a box. All we did is put it on the bed, unroll it, and wait for it to recover from the compression. Oh, does this ever feel comfy? It's so cushiony. Then we put on the sheets and the bed covers, and we found ourselves ready to order another one for our home. That's how comfortable it is. That first night's sleep was luxurious and deep, and it's been like that ever since. The RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding comes with a 120-night sleep trial and a 10-year warranty. Shipping is free. If you're disappointed with the current mattress in your RV, you owe it to yourself to try the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. Something else that's very important is that Brooklyn Bedding manufactures all their RV mattresses in their own factory in Arizona. This means they're able to use premium materials at a reasonable price for you with no middleman bringing up the costs. And right now, if you visit rvmattress.com slash rvlifestyle, you'll get 20% off your mattress with the code rvlifestyle. Again, use the promo code rvlifestyle for 20% off the cost of the RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. We're sure you'll be as thrilled with your RV mattress by Brooklyn Bedding as we are with ours. It really is the most comfortable mattress we've ever slept on. So welcome back. It's time now for a brand new segment of the podcast. This will be kind of a weekly feature that we'll do. The RV Tip of the Week. And it's from certified RV inspector Brenda of Queen Bee RV. And Brenda specializes in teaching, educating RVers how to care for their RVs. And she especially makes it easier for us women who are maybe a little bit intimidated by 
whatever we have. So what a blessing. Brenda is a certified RV inspector and an RV technician, and she uh, has put together a spring checklist for us as we get ready to hit the roads. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy her. She's going to be a regular contributor to the podcast. So, uh, Brenda, take it away. Whether you've stored your RV away for the winter or even if you're a full timer and use your RV year round, there's nothing like a good spring get ready list to start the warm weather camping season off right. Here are the steps I do when prepping for the new season. I start by washing the exterior, awning, and roof, and remember to allow the awning to dry completely before retracting. Once it's cleaned, I check all the sealant on my roof, windows, cargo doors, and inspect all over for, for possible water intrusion. Now it's time for dewinterizing and sanitizing the entire water system, including my freshwater holding tank, and this is also the time I check for plumbing leaks. Next, I send some water and tank treatment into the black and gray tanks and assess if it's time for new sewer accessories. I also sanitize the water heater, replace the anode rod with a new one, fill it with water, and check for proper operation once I have the propane system back in order. For the propane system, I suggest getting a professional leak drop test performed or at the very least swab all the propane connections with dish soap and do your own bubble test. And if they're not already full, I'll take the propane tanks to the dispenser for topping off. I check my tire pressure, the tread, the sidewall condition on all tires including the spare. If you have motorized, consider having the engine serviced and all the fluids checked. Towables can inspect their hitch assembly components. Now I can connect my seven pin to confirm the DOT lights, turn signals, brake lights, all the exterior, and check my breakaway switch and electric wheel brakes for proper operation. Now time for some electrical. I take a look at my coach battery condition for signs of corrosion, top off the water fill wells on my lead acid batteries with distilled water, and then to continue to charge them if needed. Extend and retract the slide rooms and don't forget to lube the slides. Safety essentials are my favorite items to bring peace of mind, so I test my emergency exit windows, all of the detectors, and make sure my fire extinguisher is charged. This is a great time to get that air conditioner serviced, clean the furnace return area, and check the fridge for proper operation. And finally, I scrub down the whole interior. And if this sounds overwhelming, hire a certified mobile tech or inspector and knock out over half this list. Hope this was helpful and you'll come back for more tips on the next episode. Back to you, Mike and Jen. Thanks to Brenda, the RV Queen Bee. I love her name, Queen Bee <laughs> RV. And uh, for offering up this tip on uh, uh, our spring checklist. Time now for the RV app of the week. And this is drawn from our sister blog, NewTravelTech.com. And that is a, a blog that celebrates the many different ways technology enhances the entire travel experience, not just RV travel, but all travel. And this week's app is from a, a recent new travel tech story about staying organized on the road. And that is uh, really important, not just on the road, but for your everyday life too, how to stay organized. There's a lot of apps out there. Oh yeah, but this one is, does an awesome job. It gives you a great to-do list and task management that'll help you to become more organized and more focused. The app is called To Doist, To Doist, all one word, and it's really great for travelers of all types, mm -hmm. um, as well as you know remote workers in particular. Um, it's very very simple interface. Uh, it works across all of your different devices and platforms, so your laptop, your smartphones, your tablets, all of that. And it's been around, I think, gosh, a long time, something like 16 years. Yeah. And uh, tens of millions of people use Todoist. It works on uh, all the different platforms, so you don't, you shouldn't have any trouble getting it. Now, like all of them, there's a paid version available, and the paid one, you know, gives you more features. Um, but we are very impressed with it. Give it a try, or just go check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes at rvlifestyle.com. Uh, our idea is uh, just. Uh, Get her done, as they say, right? Right. One of the most exciting developments for RVs is happening out west in Arizona. Western Land and Ranches is selling five-acre high-elevation ranches just off the famous Route 66, the birthplace of the American road trip. And these are beautiful, secluded tracts of land surrounded by majestic mountain ranges with sweeping valley views, 
The high elevation is a unique microclimate as well, giving you cooler temperatures, green grasses, and tree cover, making it unique for desert property. The community is in the center of it all, close to the best of the West, Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, Lake Havasu, Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, the Colorado River, Flagstaff, Sedona, and Historic Williams. If you're tired of crowded RV parks and paying high fees for sites, well, ownership might be right for you. This incredible collection of mountaintop properties called Greenwood Ranches hit the market and it's selling out fast. There is no HOA. You can build a house, a cabin, outbuildings, or just RV. It's your property, your way, 100% ownership. Visit the website to get details and set up a showing, ArizonaRVLand.net. That's ArizonaRVLand.net. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you buy $99 or more in merchandise. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. It's time for the RV News of the Week. We got several stories for you this week. Uh, here's one that we have been reporting on and off of about this national trend for some time. Yeah, how many of you have been at a campground and you just really can't stand it because of the smoke. It seems like at every campsite, somebody has a huge fire going, or maybe the fire's right next to your rig, and you're trying to go to sleep, and it's coming in the it's window. Coming in. Anybody who has allergies, asthma, just a lot of people don't want to breathe in all that smoke. Gets in your hair. Oh, yeah. And yeah. your, your, your clothes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. in Michigan, their Department of Natural Resources is considering finding a way to offer smokeless campsites after many, many requests. It seems like a lot of people are complaining about the smoke in the campgrounds. I mean, have you ever been there where it seems like, like the whole campground has got a cloud over it? Well, well people and, with health issues. Yeah, you people know, with health asthma? issues. Yeah, they just can't take that. They just, uh, you know, it just doesn't work for them. So they're not saying in Michigan that they're going to ban campfires, but they're trying to figure out a way to make an area to offer the availability of smoke-free campsites. And I think they'll be amazed at how many people are going to want that. Yeah, we get lots of comments on our social media pages and others about people complaining about this. And I think a lot of it is, is what you alluded to is, you know, there are so many of these sites are so crowded and you're right next to people and older sites, the fire pits right next, 10 feet, five feet yeah. from your window. Anyway, I think it'll be interesting to see how that goes. We'll monitor it for you. And Michigan's our our home state, so we'll see if they actually do anything this year with it. And I know it we have tried out several smokeless fire pits. Yeah, and they are, and that really is a big help. Uh, and a lot of people are going to you know the little gas fire pits and stuff. But uh, we'll watch and see what happens in Michigan because I think that's a bellwether for what many campgrounds will mm -hmm. do. Um, in New Hampshire, there's an interesting story that we saw this week. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services there is warning campers of a, an ongoing Legionnaire's disease investigation at the Meredith Woods and Clearwater Campground. Five people have uh, had to be hospitalized after catching Legionnaire's disease. Uh, they were in the campground. This is from uh, the fall of 2021 and as recently as January 2023. Uh, all the campers did recover, by the way. It's caused by uh, a bacteria called Legionnaire's bacteria, and you can get sick from it by um, inhaling water droplets in showers uh, or hot tubs, uh, faucets. Uh, it's usually not spread, you know, people to people or by swimming or by drinking, but uh, oftentimes it's in the plumbing system. And the health department there is investigating this, but uh, they are... Uh, urging people to be aware of that, to be careful, and uh, to report it. 
And yes, some people have gotten, you know, very ill, not in New Hampshire, but in the past with Legionnaire's disease and other places, you, it, it can be a fatal disease too, but most get better. So um, just a heads up, if uh, you have been or if you are planning to go, uh, you want to be really careful about uh, visiting that particular campground. It's uh, Meredith Woods and Clearwater Campground in New Hampshire. All right, now this is a fun story. This is always exciting. Uh, Brinkley RV officially has moved their new plant to Goshen, and Indiana, and uh, they had a local pastor there come and bless their new plant with its 250-acre campus. And we did a story on Brinkley not too long ago. It, it's when we were at the Tampa RV show. It, it's we got beautiful. to look at two of their fifth wheels, and, and, and we were impressed. They are a luxury. Uh, mid-sized fifth wheel uh, and the thing that I think why Br Br uh, Brinkley gets so much attention is the founders yes exactly they are very experienced RV people and uh, they've decided that they're gonna come make a quality fifth wheel that was just a whole emphasis on high quality uh, you can see that uh, we'll put a link in the show notes to our uh, quick look at uh, the Brinkley models we looked at uh, but we were very impressed with their work. I hope we can visit their new factory, too. Yeah, I really want to go visit their new factory. And they are committed to quality. They're, they're, these guys are all like legends in the business. And they all came together. They all, you know, I think they were all multimillionaires. <laughs> and they said, well, what if we could build our own dream RV? And uh, we interviewed one of the founders. And, and that was kind of what they did. They they got the best people they could from that they knew from the industry, brought them all together, built this brand new factory. And uh, we wish him luck. It's, it's a beautiful fifth wheel that they make. One last story for you that's kind of fun. And uh, if you're fans of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, and uh, do-it-yourself projects, um, there is a, a YouTuber who has bought the former uh, scrapped airplane that Elvis Presley had. And he had it hauled to Florida. And uh, he hopes to transform this thing into an RV. Uh, it's James Webb, and if, if you're familiar, James uh, has Jimmy's World on YouTube, and he's very popular, and uh, he is now in the process of rehabbing that, uh, the fuselage of that airplane and trying to make it into an RV. Uh, he bought it for $234,000 at an auction uh, in New Mexico in early January, uh, and uh, he, he, like I say, he wants to transform it into an RV. He's going to tour the country. And he's going to try and raise funds with charities and show that all off. So uh, you can probably follow it on his, uh, we'll put a link to Jimmy's World on can YouTube. Can you believe that Elvis would have been 88? Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's old. Uh, that is old. Elvis Presley, he kind of lives on, some people say he was last seen in Kalamazoo, Michigan. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. It's, people believe that he's out there still. <laughs> All right. When we come back, the RV questions of the week. So stay with us. When we're asked, what's the most important modification we made to our RV? It's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And Battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig, too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back. And now for the first RV question of the week. And this is from Mandy. And Mandy says, we travel with two Australian Shepherds and we're looking to buy a good dog fence to let them be outside our camper and still be constrained. But I'm hearing that some RV parks don't allow portable fences. Is that true? Mandy. Yes, it, it is true. Uh, most still do. But uh, as you say, it's, it's, I think, a trend. The, the biggest uh, story about it just broke in Indiana 
And I think that's probably what Mandy was reading. And, and uh, Indiana State Parks has told campers that portable dog fences are no longer allowed at campsites. Uh, that all dogs have to either be caged or on a six-foot leash. And apparently the reason why is dogs have uh, been hopping those little cages, those little portable cages, those fences that they set up. You've seen them at RV parks. Mm -hmm. They've been hopping there, or people have come over to pet the dogs and they've gotten bit, uh, or the dogs bark. People leave them out there for all day long and they bark too much. Uh, so Indiana has banned this in, in their state parks, no more portable dog fences. And I know several other RV campgrounds and parks around the country uh, have done the same thing or are talking about it. So that does appear to be a trend on the rise. Um, you're not prohibited from bringing dogs, but they, they, those portable dog fences just aren't working out in some places. So You can see dogs get excited. They see something, knock the fence right over. Yeah. Now, there are big ones. We, I mean, I've seen four or five foot tall ones, but still, um, you know, the, her Aussies could probably jump most of those fences. They're mm -hmm. pretty athletic dogs, Australian Shepherds. Uh, so that is true, uh, Indiana in particular, but other campgrounds, but most still will allow it. But I think we're at the point where if I was traveling with one of those and it was a, a must-have feature, I would ask when I made my reservation just to make sure I could bring a portable fence. And I can see, too, where people would get nervous because if, if a dog bites somebody, you're in trouble. Yeah. You know, the park, everybody. Yeah. So sad, but, mm -hmm. you know, that's what happens. Uh, here's a, a, a newbie question. From Pam, and I, I love these kind of questions. You know, we sometimes toss these words around, and we uh, we assume everybody knows what they are, even even when they're obvious. So, okay. So her question is: You had a recent blog story about a vehicle pulled by an RV, and you called it a toad. What's a toad? <laughs> well, it's a new car. No. Uh, well, think about it for a minute. Uh, what do you do when you are when you are uh, pulling a, another vehicle? You're towing it, right? So it's a toad. Get it? Towing toad. Uh, sounds like the name of the the little amphibious uh, creature, but it's actually uh, a toad. I guess toads aren't amphibious. They're just kind of reptiles, but frogs are amphibious. Uh, well, maybe toads are too. I don't know. They're toads. But we're talking about a vehicle that is towed, T-O-W-E-D, and it's called a toad, T-O-A-D, by our viewers. That's what it is. It's not the name of a special van. Well, I just learned something, too. I never knew where that name came from. Because you've towed it. You're towed it. What's your toad? <laughs> okay. Well, Pam, anyway, thank you for the question. And, and we love those newbie questions. You know, it, it, every now and then we all think we're talking, everybody's on the same page. And, you know, people are coming in the lifestyle at different, different phases of their life. Again, our address for your questions or your comments, Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. Uh, thanks to all of you for watching. We'll be back next week. And uh, in our next episode, we're going to talk about waking up your RV's electrical system. Really critical advice. Whatever kind of batteries you have, you want to listen to uh, our advice, and particularly about your water heater before you, uh, you set out on those trips. Uh, our expert will be, uh, guest will be Mike Sokol who is an expert on RV electricity. We can't wait to see you next week. Thank you guys so much for watching. Happy trails.